Sure. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to continue to discuss uh, the previous topics that I uh, didn't finish, and in the following, it's uh, the arc length. And the uh, area for parametric curves. For parametric curves. So uh, let's remind ourselves what is a parametric curve. Uh, before we know that we can study Cartesian curve for calculus one and two, and Cartesian curve in the following one, y equals f of x. But we can translate this curve to be a parametric one. Uh, so b to a function to be parametric means that I can write my x in terms of g of t and my y in terms of some function h of t. And then for parametric, you all, always need to specify what is my um, domain for t. So in t, here it changes from some value from a to b. And then for all these uh, parametric curves, what we do, we can uh, revisit all calculus that we have done for uh, Cartesian curve. So today, uh, like for next, let's say, 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to revisit arc length and area for parametric curve. So let's first do area. An area we're going to do in the following way. So uh, remind, let's remind ourselves if we're given a function y equals f of x, and uh, my function is given this interval a, b. So let's draw some random graph. I will have the graph of my function uh, y equals f of x. And this is my intervals a and b. And we all know how to find uh, the area of this uh, of of the area under the curve of this function between a and b. Uh, it's going to be just the integral, so this is going to be the following area. And area is given by let's call it area a. It's given by the integral of from a to b f of x dx. So my goal is right now uh, to rewrite this formula by using parametric function. And uh, before I'm going to do this, let me show you a uh, kind of motivation example, uh, what is going to be the um, advancement and why to rewriting this formula for area in terms of polar coordinates is going to be a little bit better. Uh, and the example is the following. So it's kind of motivational example. If we consider the function, not the function, if we consider the closed curve, which is a unit circle, so this is a unit circle. And this unit circle is described by equation x squared plus y squared equals to 1. Then for uh, this uh, unit circle, we can see that if we have the area, and I want to find the area by using this formula. So what do I need to do over here? I need to first solve it in terms of uh, y. So we'll have y equals plus minus uh, 1 minus x squared. So here, when I'm going to plug in either plus or minus, I will get the integral. My unit circles go from 1, negative 1 to 1. I will have the integral from negative 1 to 1 of square root of 1 minus x squared dx. But this integral doesn't will give the area of the whole circle. You will get just the area of the upper half. So in this case, you can get the area of the whole circle if you will multiply this integral by 2. But the point is, what if our circle is not symmetric and our curve looks something like this? For example, look something like this. Then by using this formula, it's impossible to find the area of the whole thing. Uh, by just by using one integral. And it's impossible if we use uh, integral in terms of Cartesian coordinates. But when I'm going to rewrite this integral in terms of polar coordinates, then we'll be able to find the area of the whole circle uh, in terms of one integral. So this is one, this is one of the motivations why we're interested in, in this. OK, so let's do next one. Let's check. Uh,
Okay, so how are we going to derive this? And derivation is the following. Um, we given that we have integral, uh, and let's first do the integral from, I'm not going to set my bounds. We're given the integral f of x dx. But what do I know? I know that my y is equals f of x. So what can I do over here? I can rewrite this thing in terms of y dx. But what else do I know? I know that y equals f of x and my x equals uh, by the for, uh, formula g of t. But if x equals g of t, we know that we can rewrite our y. It's over here. That our y is equals h of t. Or in other words, g equals x, it equals f g of t, so it's equals to h of t. Okay, it's a necessary conclusion, but every time if, uh, we have done this before. So what I'm gonna do right now, I know it is my y, I know it is my x, so I'm gonna plug in my function h and g inside my integral. But before I'm gonna do this, let's find my dx. And dx I'm gonna find the following way. We know that uh, dy over dx is equals uh, f prime of x, yes? So from here, if I will uh, multiply both sides by dx, I will get that dy is equals f prime of x dx. But what is my y? My y is just d f of x equals f prime of x dx. So in this case, if my uh, x equals g of, of t, then from here I can conclude that my dx equals to uh, d g of t, but this is just equals to g prime of t. But over there we can see that my function uh, depends on t and here on t, and but over there on x. So instead of dx, I need to write this dt. And now der derivation is done. So what I'm going to get over here, I will get that my y is equals to uh, h of t. And my uh, x equals g prime of t dt. OK. And here I'm almost done. Uh, the only thing that I need to do before I had my function, uh, Cartesian function from a to b, and the area is going to be exactly the integral from a to b f of x dx. And the thing is, what I need to do over here, I need to decide what I need to put for my boundaries. But we can see that the whole integral is in terms of t. So in, like intuitively, I know that if I want to put my boundaries, I want to find, uh, I, I, I will be given, in, usually in the problems, or we can define the initial val value of t. So here. Uh, for this point A, it's going to be equal to some point T naught, and this point B is going to be equal for some point T one. What does it mean? It means this uh, this point is described by coordinates A, f of A, because I will plug in my A, then I will get my output f of A. But in terms of uh, Cartesian coordinates, it means that my A will be equals g of T naught, and my uh, f of A is going to be equal to h of t naught. So every time when you're given a Cartesian function and some point, so one of the way how to find your t, you just solve the system of linear equations. Okay, hey, like 10 out of 10, yes. So this is how we can find your t. So uh, that's why when we want to find the area of, um, in polar chord, uh, no, in polar, in, uh, uh, parametric, uh, yeah, in parametric coordinates, then I'm interested like for which t I will get my starting position and for which t I will get my ending position. So for here, what I need to do, I will change this from a to b, here from a to b, but once I will translate this integral into a uh, parametric form, instead of a, I'm gonna plug in my t naught. Uh, t naught represents the starting position for my polar uh, parametric curve. And for T1, uh, represents the ending position for my parametric curve. Okay. 
So finally, uh, the area, let me erase this. So finally, the area of the area of this parametric function, and here, sorry, here mistake, not a and b. This is from t naught to t one. Uh, is exactly is represented uh, by this. And give me, let me give you an example uh, how to apply this formula to find the area of the union circle. So let's see what I'm going to get. So uh, we remember that uh, the first thing that you need to do, if I want to solve this problem, I need to find the parameterization uh, for a union circle. And if I'm given a union circle, uh, we remember the parameterization is going to be x equals cosine t and y equals sine t. Uh, because the unit circle is described by equation x squared plus y squared equals to 1. So you can check if you're going to plug in cosine and sine, this parametric uh, equation satisfies the Cartesian one. But the only thing, when I have a circle, I need to find my bounds for t. And for this form, when t equals 0, we'll get 1, 0. So this is going to be my starting point. And when I will have, uh, and I want to go around once. And we can see t is pretty simple. So uh, I will go around once if I, my t will change from 0 to 2 pi. So my t wants to change from 0 to 2 pi. OK. So what I do over here, if I want to find the area of this union circle, I need to apply just this formula. So we remember that area is given by formula y dx. But what is my y in this case? My y is sine t. So I will give in the integral of sine t. It's over here, like, yeah. What is my dx? dx, as we discussed, is going to be derivative of x corresponding to t times dt. So I will have a uh, derivative corresponding to uh, cos sine t is uh, negative sine t and uh, times dt. OK. And this is my area. And what is my bounds? My bounds from 0 to 2 pi. So from here, I can conclude that I have the integral uh, minus from 0 to 2 pi uh, sine squared t. So if I want to evaluate this integral, uh, we need to remember the formula for sine squared t. Uh, what I don't like in this formula, I don't like the square. So I want to get rid of square, and I'm going to get rid of square by the following approach. Um, so this sine to t equals 2. I will put just 1 cosine to t. And here's one trick. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, do you need to put plus or minus over here? So one of the way to decide is if I will multiply two by both sides, it's going to be, let's see, cosine square. Yeah, I need to put minus over here. Yeah. So it's the integral from 0 to 2 pi, uh, 1 minus cosine to t over 2. So hopefully you remember this formula. If you don't remember, like, Google or office hours. And then uh, we can see that integral of cosine and sine, and sine at 0 or at 4 pi is 0. So this term doesn't matter. So the only term is, which is matters is uh, 1 half. But here we'll have 1 half uh, integral from 0 to 2 pi to dt. So we'll get negative 1 half uh, equals to times 2 pi. So it's equals to negative pi. OK, so and you can see we almost got our area. The only exceptions we got our minus area. Yeah, and the minus area, uh, I need to change my nodes to the top of this problem. So we can say if we will take the absolute value. I don't want to take absolute value. So um, OK, so the reason why we get the minus area, you will understand like in five, uh, like in three or four more weeks when we're going to start to discuss line integrals. But so far, like, yeah, it's equals to minus five. Okay, I will need to change this if I want to, not to confuse people. Okay, uh, 15 minutes. Um, and this is an example of uh, area. So let's, instead of uh, 
let's move on to the next topic and let's do arc length. Okay. Uh, so, so right now, uh, we need to consider like if a given some function and this function gives this parametric form and you can ask yourself that you have particles that moves uh, on some trajectory and uh, then you ask yourself how far this pro uh, particle moved like uh, during some finite uh, time period and what we want to do we want to find the length of the path by using arc length formula uh, unfortunately, I will not have time to derive the whole thing, but I'm going to give you intuitional uh, derivation of the formula for the formula uh, in parametric uh, form. And the idea is to recover the formula for arc length uh, for, Carti uh, for Cartesian form. So arc length. Uh, we know that if we are given function f of x is the same in the same form. So I have some function f of x, y equals f of x. And here, this is my point A, this is my point B. So what do I have? I have this is my f of A, and this is my f of B, this point. Then uh, if I want to find, uh, if you want to find the formula for arc length by using uh, calculus one and two, we know that length equals to the integral uh, from A to B of uh, one plus F prime of X squared DX. And derivation for the arc length for the same formula in terms of polar coordinates is almost going to be the same. So the first thing, let's uh, forget for a second uh, our bounds and let's try to derive the formula and the worry about the bounds. And then in the end, I'm going to come back to our bounds. Uh, so let's say, for this Cartesian function, we given uh, some parameterization, x equals uh, h of t, yeah, uh, g of t, and y equals h of t, where t changes uh, from t naught into t1. So when uh, we have t naught, we have our initial point, let's say this way, this point, and when t1, we have our uh, terminal point. Then what we're going to do over here, uh, do you remember that dy over dx equals f prime of x? So the first step that I'm going to do over here, I'm going to rewrite my f of x in terms of uh, dy and dx. Take my chalk. Uh, so I will have the integral of uh, square root of square root of one plus dy over dx squared. But not only this, in this step, I will take this dx and uh, move, it, uh, move this dx under the square root formula. So I will get dx squared. And then we can see that we can, uh, no factor. We can multiply like these brackets, and what I will get, I will get the integral, the square root uh, dx squared uh, plus, and when I multiply these two factors, dx uh, squared will get canceled, dy squared. But as we did before, uh, by finding dx and dy when x equals g of t and y equals h of t, we know that dx is equals g prime of t dt and uh, dy equals h prime of t dt. So you can plug it in this dx and dy here. You can see that dt is a common factor. So we're gonna factor dt out of square root as we did before. So what I will get, I will get the integral, uh, the square root of uh, g prime of t squared plus h prime of t uh, squared dt. And here we're going to come back to our bounds. We know that if we, you're looking for the arc length, you're interested at what point do you start and what is your ending point for each parameter t, you will get uh, starting and ending point. 
And here my initial point is going to be t naught, and my ending point is t1. And this is exactly the arc length area for um, parametric curve. OK. So let's apply this formula right now to find the arc length of a union circle. I don't like blackboards. So so many chalk. OK. And it's bad for your health. So uh, example. So we're given a, a union circle, x equals cosine t, y equals sine t, and t changes from 0 to 2 pi. So arc length of the circle, we know that if you give a unit circle, we're given the graphs that look like this, x, y. And we know that the length, uh, by just using the, the first fact, one of the first facts that we learn about circle, that the length of the circle, l is equals to two pi r. But if r is uh, equals to 1, it's just 2 pi i. So by applying that formula, we'll expect to get 2 pi. And let's see what, what I'm going to get. So the arc length is going to be the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the square root. And uh, in, uh, derivative of cosine is negative sine t, plus derivative of sine is cosine t. But if you're going to use uh, the fun like fundamental trigonometric identity, or like the main trigonometric identity, it equals to 1. So I have just integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 dt, because sine squared plus cosine squared equals to 1, and square root of 1 is just 1. And from here, I will get 2 pi. OK. And this is the formula for arc length uh, for parametric curve, which is given by this equation. OK, and this is I'm done with uh, lecture two, where I talk about uh, calculus with parametric curves. OK. So let's see, what is my next thing? Uh, is my paper. OK, so then the next, what they want to discuss, I want to discuss introduction to polar coordinates. So let me raise the board. And so far, if oh, two people are watching, uh, do you have any questions or any comments? Again, I'm, I'm doing this video just for practice because I'm going to teach multivariable calculus this summer. So after each teaching, I, want, I like to analyze and change my lecture notes because I will find definitely some mistakes or I will find a little bit better way of explaining stuff. And this stuff is really cool to explain when you can interact with people, when uh, you can ask them questions and they can answer you back. So I really like interactive lectures. And I try the interactive ones. But the problem sometimes it takes a little bit more time, so you know, it's really difficult to cover a lot of stuff. But I believe sometimes it's more important to understand more simpler problems, because if you want to understand more difficult ones, you will not definitely understand them right away. Or like you shouldn't expect yourself. If you, will, if you will, it's going to be super cool. But usually it's really difficult to understand the problem from scratch. But if you do for some of them, then it's super cool. If you do for all of them, you're a genius. OK. Uh, so polar, polar, polar coordinates. What is a nice introduction to polar coordinates? So polar coordinates. Um, right now, we uh, have covered the idea that we're given a Cartesian function. And for this Cartesian function, we can find its parametric form as where x equals g of t and y equals h of t. But uh, there is another form that we can find for the function. It's called polar form. 
And what is the point of the polar form? We can see that sometimes when you give a Cartesian function and we translate this function into parametric form, then some calculus problems uh, will be a little bit easier to do as we did in the previous example by finding the area of a circle with radius r of a unit circle. We can do this under one integral. So the reason why we want to do this polar form because some of the function uh, which doesn't look like too difficult, but even in translating them into polar coordinates, uh, into, into polar form, like the function is going to be like super easy to describe. So for example, if I'm giving this circle with radius like uh, two, so I have x squared plus y squared equals to two squared, then in polar form, the same circle is going to be just equals r equals to two. So you can see how the equation of a circle in polar form is going to be super simple. So uh, the idea for the polar form, sometimes you want to take something difficult and translate from Cartesian to polar, or even opposite. Sometimes if something uh, uh, looks real difficult in polar form, I want to describe in Cartesian one. So it's just one of the way to measure things. But if you want to study this transition from Cartesian to polar coordinates, first we need to study uh, into polar form, first we need to study polar coordinates. Okay, so what here is this? So our first step to study polar coordinates. Okay, I will check if I forget to mention something. Uh, okay. So in order to study the polar coordinates, let's first uh, to recover what is Cartesian coordinates. In Cartesian coordinates, we have two perpendicular lines, one with x direction, another with y direction. So at every point in the plane, I will are going to be described uh, by how far do you go in x direction here by a units, and how far do you go in y directions uh, by b. Units. So this point is described a. And b. Okay. Um, and what about polar? So this is what's Cartesian. In polar coordinates, in polar coordinates, uh, what we're gonna do, we're gonna fix, we're gonna imagine like that we have imaginary x-axis. So we don't draw axis, so axis right now. And in polar coordinates, in Cartesian coordinates, I use variables x and y to describe my points inside the plane. But for polar coordinates, I'm going to use component r and theta. So uh, how to introduce this? Um, if uh, for Cartesian coordinates, uh, the point represents how far do you go in x direction, how far do you go in b direction. Then for polar coordinates, what we can think, we, we can imagine that we have an x axis, and then you, how we can get, uh, for example, uh, from this point origin to this point A, B. You can either go from zero to A and from A to B, or we can go straight forward. And how we can, uh, oh, this may be nice, yeah. So when we're gonna go by this path, this path exactly represents our polar coordinates. And this path is described by the angle theta that we're going to rotate uh, in, contra uh, in contra clockwise rotation and how far we're gonna go, uh, so r in this direction. And this is exactly the polar coordinates. So polar coordinates, we take uh, like this x axis, we rotate it by some angle theta. And then, uh, we will go in positive direction by this length r. And this is exactly uh, going to be the point r and theta. OK. So uh, let's do a couple of examples and see uh, what we will get. So uh, we have four points, so example.
So we have point A, which is equals to 1, 5, far, 5 pi over 4. We have point B, which is equals to uh, 2 and 3 pi. We have point uh, C, which is equals 2, negative 2 pi over 3. And point D, negative 3, uh, 3 pi over 4. OK. So let's first do uh, point, point A. So let's start with this imaginary x and imaginary y axis. So first, I'm going to rotate by 2 pi over 4. So what does it mean? I imagine that I have a vector, let's say a unit vector uh, in positive x direction. I'm going to rotate this vector by 5 pi over 4. So what I'm going to get, I'm going to get that my vector is going to be in this position. And then I want to go from the origin towards uh, positive direction of this vector by one unit. But I already like take this vector as one unit, so I will get this point. So this is my point A. Okay, so maybe instead of this, I need to get this one. Okay. So this point is uh, 1, 5, 5, or 4. OK, what about if I will get uh, point B? So for point B, I have 2 and 3 pi. So in the same, I will start with this unit vector, and I will rotate by around uh, origin by 3 pi. So if I rotate by 2 pi, I will come back to, into this position. But if I rotate by pi, I will be over here. So my vector right now is pointing towards negative x direction. And I want to go in this direction, uh, in this positive direction, by 2 units. So I will have 1 and 2. So this point is going to be b with coordinates 2 and 3 pi. OK, let's do the next point. The next point is 2, negative 2 pi over 3. So here's the same thing. I can start, I'm starting like with this unit vector towards x direction. But if we rotate uh, counterclockwise, it's going to be positive rotation represented by positive sign. But if I have negative, I'm going to rotate uh, towards uh, uh, clockwise. So I want to rotate this by negative 2 pi over 3. And negative 2 pi over 3 is going to be approximately, this my was A, uh, it's going to be approximately something like this direction. And here I want to go by 2 units. So what I will get, I will get this point C over here. And C has coordinates 2 and negative 2 pi over 3. OK, and the last one, the most interesting one, I believe. Uh, let me do this, the next one over here. Yeah, I think if I'm going to give a lecture on this one, I need to do separate graphs, because right now this graph is a little bit messy. So sorry. Uh, but the most important is the last one. So the last one. First, I'm rotate my unit vector by 3 pi over 4. And what I will get, I will get uh, this direction. This is my positive direction. And then I will go by distance negative 3. So what does it mean? Oh, Danny. So what, uh, hi, Danny. So what does it mean that negative 3? Negative 3 means instead of going in positive direction here, I will go towards negative direction. So I'll go by 3 units into this direction. So I will get uh, this point. And this is my point D, negative 3, 3 pi over 4. OK, so um, yeah. so right now we know how to uh, graph the points. So we need to spend less time on this, how to graph points in, in polar coordinates. The next thing is, for example, over here, I went from uh, Cartesian into polar coordinates. Uh, I know how I can do this. and. Uh, the derivation actually is going to be in this form. So if I have Cartesian and I have polar, so the next topic, what I want to do, I want to go from Cartesian to polar coordinates. So here I want to go from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates. So here I'm given point A, B. And uh, let's be more specific. Let's take point, I don't know, um, 
that's nice. Let's take point one one. No, for a B or one more. No, let's keep AB. Let's keep it. Get rid of B. I will do example. So, uh, if Cartesian point is described by point AB, and I want to find the corresponding R and theta, then uh, R and theta and AB connected by a real nice formula. So let's take a look at this triangle. For this triangle, we have two sides with length A and length and length D, and we know that this angle is uh, ninety degrees. So what can I conclude? I can conclude so from this point A and B, I can find my R, and R is going to be equal a square root of A square plus B square. And it's actually going to be equals plus minus. And you need to choose plus minus depends on theta how you're going to rotate your vector. Because you remember, when what we did in this problem, we rotated this angle this vector by angle 3 pi over 4 but then we use our r to go in negative direction so instead of plus you will choose minus and what about theta but theta we can find uh, by the following formula you know if you're given this angle theta then tangents of theta is going to be equals to uh b over a so my theta is going to be equal to our tangents so inverse tangent of b over a yeah and here we need to be careful sometimes and the reason we're careful because uh what if my point is going to be given over here so we can see we yeah, either can have this angle or have this angle so uh, when we're going to evaluate this formula, sometimes you need to add factor plus pi. But this is going to be, uh, no, we should talk about this. Um, what I wrote over here. Uh. Okay, here I need to work uh, to decide how I should explain this because this this part is tricky. This part is tricky. I need to think about it. But this formula works. So let's do an example. An example is going to be the following form. So here my example. So for example, let's consider uh, a couple of uh, point in Cartesian plane. So let's x, y. Let's do this point first, uh, point A11. And let's take some interesting point, which uh, going to be equals to, uh, let me think about what point they want to use. Uh, let's use this one, uh, point B, 0, negative 1. Okay. So let's first do point A and find for point A uh, what is my uh, corresponding uh, polar coordinates for Cartesian one. So in this case, I can see that first one, what is my R? So my R is distance from the origin. And here's X and Y is one, then my R is exactly is going to be uh, square root of two because uh, one plus one equals to two. And then I need to figure out by what angle do I want to rotate my vector. And here I can a uh, couple of ways to rotate my vector. I can rotate either like this direction or this direction. And usually the best option to choose, uh, you choose rotation with the smallest angle. So in this case, I'm choosing uh, this angle. And according to that formula, then my theta is equal to the inverse tangent of uh, B or A, but it's, I will here I will get one and one, so I will get just inverse tangent of one. But in this case, we know the tangent inverse of one is just five or four, and you can see it's true based on the picture because I have the ang uh, the triangle with sides one one and right angle, so each of these angles are forty five degrees. So my point is uh, square root of two and five or four. 
And you know that originally I will get r squared equals to two, and then we'll get plus minus two. But since I choose like this direction, you can see I need to go by positive direction of square root of two, because if I want to go into this direction, I will get negative square root of two. Because instead of going into positive direction of my rotation, I will go towards negative direction. So coordinates of, of this point is negative square root of two, pi over four. And coordinates of this point is square root of two and pi over four. Okay, so I hope this is clear. And what about this point? And for this point, uh, so what is the point B? So we have point zero one. And then what point I will get in polar coordinates? Uh, the first one is radius, but radius here is uh, clear. So radius here is going to be just equals to one because one component is zero and another component is one. Uh, or equals minus one, we will go and decide. And by what angle do we need to rotate over here? So let's figure out the angle. So what is my tangent? Inverse tangent. So I have my theta equals to inverse tangent of uh, B over A. Yes? Second. Uh, yeah, I believe there is a mistake. Uh, this is a uh, formula for tangent theta is. Uh, X R cosine. Uh, yeah, it's tangent. Yeah. Okay. So let's just do it. So what I will get, I will get um, tangent inverse and my x component. Ah, yeah, I see the problem. So the problem over here that my b component is negative one and my x component is zero. Okay. And here I have a mistake because I cannot divide by zero. So what do you need to do in this case? So the first thing that we can see that based on this picture, we don't need to do any, any formula. If I will rotate my original vector by negative pi over two and go by a positive one direction, I will get this point. So my uh, polar coordinates is going to be a one negative pi over two. But how can I derive uh, this formula without using uh, like a picture? And the point is, you either have this triangle or we're going to have this triangle. So what do you need to do? If you can see that one of the points you divide by zero, what do you need to do with this point? You need to switch them. So when you're going to switch them, uh, no, I don't like this. How to explain this? Okay, it's really good that I did this beforehand because I know the, the I know the right answer, but it's sometimes challenging to explain to someone without any confusion. Okay, I need to think about, it. yeah. So, okay, okay, so let's just keep in one. Uh, so the basic idea we can see that uh, uh, this coordinates of this point zero one polar coordinates is going to be one negative pi over two. So sometimes it's really useful to just base in a picture or, okay. So let's move on to the next one. So here we figure out how to do uh, Cartesian coordinates into polar one, and let's do uh, opposite direction. So I assume that we're given the polar coordinates and I want to find Cartesian one. So what I'm given, I'm given polar coordinates and I want to find Cartesian one. Cartesian coordinates. So uh, for polar coordinates, we're given r and theta. And for this r and theta, I want to find the corresponding x and y. Let's draw a picture. So we know that if we have r and theta, we're giving some points that looks like this. So I will rotate my vector by theta. And this is my distance r. But then by using uh, the formula for cosine theta, what is my cosine theta? My cosine theta is going to be uh, this coordinate in x direction, let's name x, and a coordinate in y direction is y. Then my cosine theta is equals to uh, x 
over r. So I'll have x over r. And what about my y? Oh, what about my sine theta? And sine theta here equals to y over r. So I will have y over r. And if you're given r and theta, you want to find x and y. So x and y is going to be like my output. Then we can see that x equals r cosine theta. And y equals r sine theta. And this is going to be exactly the formula uh, for Cartesian uh, by tr uh, translating polar coordinates. By translating polar coordinates into Cartesian one. So I will get x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. Okay, and uh, we did some examples. So let me just do one example. So example. Let's assume we're given point uh, r theta equals uh, 2 pi over 3. So how this point looks like, I rotate by 60 degrees counterclockwise. I will get this dotted line, and then I will go in towards positive direction by two units. So I will get this point 2 pi over 3. But let's get the co corresponding Cartesian one. So I will get is that x equals and y equals two. And x equals for both of them, I will have r, r, so we'll have two and two. And then I'm going to multiply by cosine pi over three. And cosine pi over three is going to be equals to uh, one half. And uh, sine pi over three is going to be equals to the three or two. So I will get x equals to one and y equals to square root of three. So this point I will translate into one and square root of three. And you can see based on this picture is true because my y component is longer than my x component. Okay. Uh, so, so here we are done. So we introduce the main tool. We were given like uh, Cartesian coordinates and then we know how to move to polar one and we know how to move back backwards. So right now what we can do by having this knowledge, we can start to translate equation, equations of uh, some simple curves that we knew how it looks like in um, Cartesian form. So we want to find these curves in polar one. Where's Chuck? So, okay, so let's do first example. And first example, uh, let's take a circle with radius r. So we have x, y, and we give in the circle x squared plus y squared equals r squared. This is my r. Um, so based on this example, I can see that, uh, what is my x equals to? My x equals r cosine theta. I raised, yeah, I raised. I know that x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. Okay, here's the problem. So I have the same r, so I will indicate this r by big R. Yeah, because this r and this r are different r's. And then if I'm gonna plug in my uh, x and y inside of my formula, what I will get, I will get uh, that uh, r cos sine theta squared plus r sine theta uh, squared equals to r squared. Here I'm going to factor r squared, so we'll get r squared equals big R squared. So maybe I need to use instead of big R, just a. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the square root of both sides, so we'll get r equals r and r equals negative r. Uh, and we can see this is going to be equation of a circle with radius big R in terms of polar coordinates. 
And the reason is why it's pretty intuitional. If you will take how to describe a circle, the definition of the circle is the set of points which is uh, equidistance from the origin. But it basically doesn't mean that you will take the vector with length r, and you're just going to rotate this vector uh, around the origin. So what I'm going mm -hmm. to get, I'm going to get this circle. So for every point in polar coordinates, for any theta, I always going to get that my radius equals to r. So my formula doesn't depend on theta. And for the homework problem, I want you to figure out uh, what is the difference between r equals this one and r equals negative big r. And yeah, it's pretty interesting. OK, so the first example circle we are done. Um, also, uh, exercise, what is the form uh, going to look like? Ah, no, it's not exercise. Yeah, I need to do this one. OK, so uh, any questions about this? And no questions, and we move on to the next one. So let's do another example of a circle, but a little bit more interesting one. So example two. Example circle two. So right now, instead of uh, a unit uh, circle with uh, radius i the origin, I will consider a unit circle. I will take a unit circle with a center. And where is my center is uh, at one zero. And uh, yeah, insert with center one zero. So what I will get over here graphically, I will get uh, one zero is located here. So I will get the circle in the following form, x, y. And here you can see one small trick. If I will take different value of theta, so when theta equals to zero, I have r, that equals to two. When theta will equals to this value, I will get this r, which is shorter than this one. So for what formula do you expect to get? So the first thing, what the formula looks like in Cartesian coordinates? In Cartesian coordinates, we remember that it equals to x minus one squared plus y squared equals to one, because we move our center uh, by one unit towards positive x direction. But for my middle coordinate, I would expect my formula depends on theta. Because for the different theta, I will get different radius. And when my theta will go towards negative pi over 2 or pi over 2, my radius will go to 0. So let's see what I will get. But the idea is the same. I know that x equals uh, is it? r cosine and y equals r sine theta. So what I will get over here, I will get r cosine theta minus 1 squared plus r sine theta squared equals to 1. So here we'll get r squared cosine squared theta minus 2 r cosine theta plus 1 plus r cosine r squared uh, sine squared theta equals to 1. So let's simplify this formula a little. What I will get? I will get that 1 and 1, one, and one will cancel. Then if I will factor r squared r squared, I will get cosine squared plus sine squared equals to 1. So I will have just r squared and minus 2r cosine theta equals to 0. I can simplify this formula even more. What do I need to do? I need to factor my r. So when I will factor my r, I will get r equals to r minus 2 cosine theta equals to 0. So one mistake that people usually do, instead of factoring out r, they just cancel it out. But when you cancel out i, it means you divide by r. But when you divide by i, it's going to be important, like in the future examples, uh, you need to assume that r doesn't equal to 0. But sometimes uh, when people are dividing, they're missing one case when r equals to 0. And this is really important. So here, as a, your next step, you consider two cases. You're saying that r equals to 0. Because when you have the product of two numbers equals to zero, it means the first number equals to zero or the second number equals to zero. So in this case, I will get r equals to zero or r minus two cosine theta equals to zero or r equals two cosine theta. 
But when r equals to zero, it means in polar coordinates for every theta, my radius is zero. And this is exactly correspond to a point. And this graph is wrong. That's why this case doesn't work. Let's check this case. When theta equals to zero, I will get cosine of zero is one, so I will get this point to zero. Okay. When theta equals to pi over four, cosine of pi over four is one. No. Cosine of uh, pi over four, it's tangent of pi over four is one. Cosine of pi over four is square root of two over two. Uh, and I will have uh, square root of two. Yeah, so this is also correct, why? Because I will get like this point, which is uh, exactly x coordinates one and one. So the length of my uh, radius is going to be exactly square root of two, which correspond. Okay, and this is going to be the equation of a circle uh, with center at one zero. An exercise, exercise, blah, 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 exercise. How I should so start exercise, exercise. Uh, find the same formula, center at zero, one. Okay. Uh, so we did the circle examples. Um, let's do a little bit different one. Um, so we know how to do circles. What's the next? Let me show you an example. When so for the circle ones, we were starting with Cartesian uh, equation, which is uh, didn't look difficult. But when you get a polar form, okay, this one is not nice. But the previous one, when r equals r, is really nice. But let me show you example when we start with some Cartesian curve, and then we're gonna translate this curve into. Uh, polar coordinates, then as my, the form of my curve will look a little bit more complicated. So let's start with y equals to 3. So y equals to 3 is just a line. And the line that looks like uh, this, it's 1, 2, 3, and positive y-axis. So we have x and y. And let's describe this curve uh, in polar coordinates. What I will get? I know that uh, y is equals r sine theta. Yes. So here what I will get, I will get that r sine theta equals to y, but y equals to 3, so r sine theta equals to 3. And if I want to get a function, I want to solve this in terms of theta. So I'm going to divide both sides by sine theta. I will get 3 divided by sine theta. And this is going to be equation for my line. And uh, this equation is interesting because uh, let's take theta equals to 0. A second. Y is the correct one. Theta equals to zero. Ah, oh, no, everything is right. Okay. Yes. Let's take theta equals to pi over two. When theta equals to pi over two, I will get uh, like y axis, and I need to go, uh, and then my r equal to three. Yeah, so exactly I will get this point. Okay, so this point will get to three and pi over two. But you can see when I will start and move my theta uh, towards uh, zero, so I will, I will decrease my theta, then my radius will become bigger, bigger, and bigger. But when my theta equals to zero, this function is undefined. But this function is not undefined. When I have zero over here, then my r is going to be plus infinity because for zero, technically my radius is going to look like this, so it's infinite. So this formula makes sense. OK, any questions about this? Blah, blah. OK. And let's do the last uh, two important examples. Um, yeah, so here is this. OK, too harsh. Oh. Oh, I don't like the boards.
Let's see how much time is left. Okay, so one hour, so 20 minutes. Um, okay, so let's... Okay, so uh, the next example that I want to do, I want to find is a graph. So right now, uh, let's remind ourselves. So uh, first we were starting like how uh, we uh, given like Cartesian equations, we found this equation in terms of polar coordinates. But right now we are given just polar equation y uh, plus sine theta. And I want to draw this, uh, function in terms of uh, polar coordinates. So I want to find the graph of this function. And if you take a look at this problem first, like you have an idea what to do because one of the easiest way that uh, you make a table. So you make a table of theta and then table as it R, and then you plug in like different thetas, but it's gonna be a little bit messy. And when you're gonna uh, graph a bunch of points over here, it's also like, so the whole thing is going to be just messy. Uh, let, me see, let me double check something. Oh, okay, so I need to. Yeah, a lot of stuff. Um, Okay, so what I recommend over here, I recommend uh, by using this approach. So let's find a function of sine. So this is my this is my theta, and this is my sine theta. Uh, the graph is this function. The graph is this function that I will have. This is my pi, two pi, uh, my maximum value one, my minimum value negative one. So the graph of my function. Uh, will look something like this. So my function will go like this. And here I have one plus sine theta. So right now by having this graph and by having uh, this equation, I can see how what's going on with my function. So when theta equals to zero, my sine of zero is zero. And r then, how to it's basically also I'm doing table, but I'm doing table visually. But one plus zero is gonna be just one. So what I have for theta equals to zero, I have this point, uh, this point. So this point is one, zero. Then I'm going towards pi over two. So right now I will go this direction. And when I go this direction, uh, my radius will increase because uh, from zero to pi over two, my sine function is increasing and it's going to reach maximum at one. So when, I, the sine, when theta equals to pi over two, what I will get, I will get the length exactly, which is equals to two. And this changes is gonna be given by uh, slightly change, slightly like increasing of my, oh, the graph is gonna be hor horrible, but it's okay. But then what is going on? When my uh, angle changes from pi over two to pi, then my uh, radius will decrease from two to one back. So I will get to two to one back. And, uh, okay, so here. What's with audio? There is no audio or? Is it rainbow? Okay. Um, Okay, so the next thing. Uh, so let's figure out what happened with my r when my angle changes from pi to three pi over two. My uh, minimum number for sine is going to be negative one. So when theta equals to three pi over two, I will have one minus one equals to zero. So three pi over two equals this point. But when my angle changes from pi to three pi over two, my radius is going to decrease from one to zero. So I will have uh, here is one, somewhere here is one half, and here is zero. So 
to my graph is and you can check that when my angle changes from 3 pi to 2 pi my radius will start to increase from 0 to 1 so i will have this graph and we get something that looks like hard hopefully yeah so this is a graph of 1 plus sine theta Holy moly, yes, holy moly, so sudden, and my many ears. Okay. I'm glad that you guys understand each other because I have no idea what you text texting about. But hi, Alberta. Yeah. And this is graph of one plus sine theta. Okay. Uh, let's do another one. So do you have any questions about how I find this graph? Like, war? was I clear or? Okay, and let's do the next one. The next one is a little bit more interesting. So let's do R equals cosine to theta. Okay, so for this graph, uh, I'm gonna do the same thing. But instead of uh, drawing sine theta, I want to draw cosine to theta. Uh, it's a little bit tricky, but let me show how to do this. So we have theta and here you have like your output is cosine theta or no, your output is R. So this is my pi, this is my two pi. Then I know how this, uh, cosine uh, theta looks like. And cosine theta looks, this is my maximum one and my negative well, negative one. So my cosine theta looks something like this. It's go here, here. So right now I want to figure out how is cosine two theta looks like. So what happened with cosine two theta? If before, if I want to go the whole cycle, I need to change my theta from zero to two pi. Then right now, if I have two theta over here, if I want to go the whole cycle. Uh, in other words, for this graph, my theta changes is from zero to two pi. Yes? But, uh, if I have two theta, that it's enough to change my theta only from zero to pi. And then my theta will going to change from zero to pi. Then my two theta will change from zero to two pi. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, it's confusing. In my time, it's already like 12, 20 a.m. Plug a guitar. Or maybe my microphone is, yeah, I feel like I just need to reinstall my drivers for my, other people complain. I will try not to touch it. Uh, this two theta. So when my theta equals to pi, cosine of two theta gonna be equals to one. So this two theta means just I will take my cosine function and it will shrink it. So what, does it, what, do, what do I mean? When theta equals to zero, I will get this point. When theta equals to pi over four, two and four will cancel out, so I will get pi over two. So for pi over four, I will get uh, my new zero. So my function will change like this. When cosine, uh, th when theta equals to pi over two, so this point, two will cancel out, so cosine pi equals to negative one. So I will have this point. And then I will come back here like this. So you can see that, uh, when my theta changes from zero to two pi, I will get the whole cycle of cosine. And the same is gonna be true for the rest. Okay, so right now let's have this picture in mind and let's try to find the graph uh, in terms of polar coins, x and y. Theta equals uh, to zero, I have point 0.1. This is my favorite graph, one of my favorite. Uh, theta equals to pi over four, and pi over four, remember, is this line, and I will get zero. But all along from the point uh, pi over, uh, from zero to pi over four, my radius, you can see, will decrease. So what I will get over here, will get something that looks like this. Okay, let's continue. Then from uh, pi over four uh, to pi over two, I will have negative radius. So it means, uh, instead of driving something over here, I'm gonna draw in opposite. Uh, I will draw it over here. 
So what I say, what I will get? When uh, I will get uh, theta equals to pi over two, so I will have this line. I need to draw my radius equals to negative one. So negative one uh, means I will get this point. Uh, sorry, one second. So. Oh, okay, so everything is right. So what is going on here? I will start with radius equals to zero and my radius will increasing until I will reach this point. So I will get this point. Then uh, my theta changes from uh, pi over two to pi. So I will keep going. I will go this direction, but my radius is still is negative. And you can see I will get this part because my radius will de decrease. And then at pi, uh, my radius is changing uh, from pi, no, it's pi over two. Oh, fuck. Yeah, I know this is. Okay, I'm too tired. Okay, you will get something like this. <laughs> I'm too tired to explain. Uh, not to try to explain, I just got really messy. Okay, so you will get like this flower and uh, you, we can double check ourselves because, okay, so each of this bump, each of, of, each of this bump will give you us like uh, zero radius, one radius and zero one. So here I can see that, oh, okay, this may be the easier way to explain. I have my angle pi and pi from uh, minus pi over four, which is this line, and pass the pi over four, and I have this bump. Then between like uh, this negative bump is represented by this curve, and this negative bump is this one. Okay, it's not my lecture, so I will try to better explain during my lecture. Um, oh my gosh, it takes so long. Uh, let's see if. Hey, black pen, right pen. Yeah, I need to practice for my lectures and I have done only like three lectures, so I need to work a little bit harder. Because when you teach sometimes like you know the material, but it's just not so obvious how I should explain this to people to make it more accessible. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's right. Okay, um, so what is next do I want to discuss? Uh, and let's do, let's do just the last thing. Uh, so right now we discuss when we uh, were given like a Cartesian graph and we move into polar one. Uh, and let's do one example. When we're given polar graph uh, and we want to move to Cartesian. And you're gonna ask like why? So for example, if I will give you the graph R equals sine theta. And if you haven't seen this before, because we did similar one, we did R equals two cosine theta, then how we can graph this without using actual polar coordinates? And the trick is sometimes it's easy to graph some polar curves if you will translate them into Cartesian. And what we want to do, we want to translate them into Cartesian by having uh, this formula that connects polar Cartesian, which is R cos sine theta. And Y equals R sine theta. Yeah, I, have, I will have lectures in uh, end of June till August 16. Uh, this are gonna be like crazy eight weeks of teaching, so. We will see how it goes. So how can I use this formula to find this polar equation into Cartesian form? So what do I need to do? If I'm gonna plug in R cosine theta here and do some manipulation, it's gonna be crazy. So like, don't do this. What we need to do, we want to find the pattern, the pattern. And here I can see I have sine theta, but here I have R cosine, R sine theta. So if I, if I will have 
r here, then the whole right hand side equals to y. So what do I want to do? I want to just multiply both. So how I can make this r? I just need to multiply both sides by r. So I will get r squared equals to 2r sine theta. And then, voila, like on the left hand side, I have r squared. And r squared we know is just x squared plus y squared equals to what? Equals to what? But here, r sine theta, this is my y. So it equals to 2y. And you can check uh, after doing some algebra and complete, uh, completion square, I will get x squared plus y minus 1 squared equals to 1 which is exactly the equation of a circle. So what I will get, I will get the equation when uh, my center of a circle at point zero 0.01, my circle of the radius one. So this is my graph, r equals two sine theta. So there is uh, a bunch of different ways how we can graph uh, polar uh, curves, but the main idea and the principle is uh, just do a lot of practice. So if you want to be comfortable of graphing these sunflower curves, we just need to practice more. Okay. And on this step, um, symmetry, there is one topic, symmetry. Okay, I will skip this one. Um, okay, so here we're done of uh, non-calculus part doing four polar coordinates. So let's do, and I'm gonna, Oh, actually, maybe I will just do polar part later. So how much time did it take me? So polar part took me one hour to explain. Okay. Okay, this is end of lecture and polar calculus I will do later because you can see this is my lecture notes. And polar part, I have just written example definition, but I didn't do actual stuff. So, so it's like it's empty. Yeah, if you want a black pen or a pen, I can show you like complete version of the first lecture. It looks something like this. Yeah, what I want to do, I want to share yeah, this with my students. So, because uh, like my English is not perfect and sometimes I can move too fast or too slowly for some people. So I'm doing these lectures and for motiv motivated student, I will have for them, uh, where is it? A lot of, uh, not examples, a lot of exercises. Yeah, yeah, so this is like exercise, exercise, like, and so it's gonna be fun. Yeah, I was actually planning to share my notes with you guys and to get your feedback. I found one source like when I can make a wiki, a wiki learning page when, where I can share my lecture notes uh, my worksheets, uh, my quizzes, and etc. So my goal is uh, try to create uh, a nice educational resource for learning multivariable calculus because I have been teaching this class like already like six or seven times, and I really really like this class. But this summer is going to be my first time when I teach this class as an actual professor. Professor, so it's going to be cool. My shirt. Uh, let's see. Uh, I, I I don't have website. I want to create website, um, and this is like one of the goals for the summer. And on the website, I want to share uh, my lecture notes for Math 53 and other stuff. Uh, uh, my shirt. This is my my uh, parents' dog. This is like Dukes. We have like two dogs, and actually, the crazy thing is that I'm going to North Carolina tomorrow, and. Uh, they're like, let me show a picture if I have one. Mm. No, unfortunately, I don't. No, I have one. Yeah, so I'm going to do my camera for one week, so it's going to be pretty fun. Yeah, I just uh, like, I want people to enjoy calculus because uh, what I've heard a lot of people, they're so complain a lot about multiverbal calculus, it's too difficult, but it's actually, it's really easy and really beautiful once you understand and see a picture. So this is my goal, I want to make life easier for people and for my students especially. Uh, 
Do you have any other questions? Here is a nice picture. It's like I hate blackboards. They're so dusty. It's like my the whole phone is. Yeah. This is my dog. So this is Duke Boxer. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know if people have any questions or want to ask something or just just talk about life. Okay. Let's more. So do you want to see some linear algebra or um, let me think. I learned a couple of cool concepts recently. Uh, what is the most astonishing one? Um, I can talk about, let's field completion. Okay. so. Uh, let's talk about some advanced linear algebra. Okay, so, and the idea is uh, to introduce linear algebra. So, a lot of people when see this concept of linear algebra, they got scared, like, oh my gosh, like what is going on? But Lie algebra is basically is just regular algebra with some updates. What do you mean, like, no, no, no. Don't. Linear operators, spectral theorem. Oh, I can one. Oh, fuck. Sorry, guys. I will fix it, I promise. Okay. Um, like Lie algebra. So what is a Lie algebra? So the idea is if we're given a vector space V, V is a vector space. So thank you. Uh, I haven't received your text, Black Panther Penny. So maybe we'll receive some. So we have a vector space, and I want to explain what is the algebra. So what does it mean like that I have a vector space? That if I will take two elements in my vector space, then for this vector space, I have a vector addition, and it means the sum of these two elements will belong to vector space. And my second like thing that I required that I will take uh, some vector x, and uh, have a vector space, let's say like over R, where R is my scalars. So I will take some vector space, a vector X, and I can multiply and rescale it by some scalar C. And this also is going to be inside my uh, vector space. Yeah, don't worry, like, to understand the algebra, it's just surprising. I'm going to just show you definition and show you one example. And the most important thing I believe is that everyone needs to know at least one example of Lie algebra and you will see it soon, so don't worry. So the first thing, like Lie algebra is based in the vector space. And vector space, which is like, uh, let me show you example of the vector space that you familiarize yourself. So if it will take V equals to R2, yes, then uh, if X belongs to V, then X will be represented by two components, A and B. It's actually, I did this in my previous lecture for uh, polar coordinates. And it means just my uh, X will be represented by a vector with uh, positive, uh, no, uh, where I go 
in uh, x direction by a units and in y direction by b. So I will have this vector x. That's my x and y. And uh, so what does it mean? Like, let's check that this is a vector space. Uh, again, like these two kind of axioms are not enough. For each of these axioms, we need to check uh, that this is commutative, associative. So I'm not going to focus on this one because it's like it's important, but the more important to understand the idea of the vector space. And the first thing that I want to check that I want to check that if I will take two vectors, then their sum belongs to V. But this is true because I will take another vector, let's say Y, that looks like this, and I will add these two vectors. I will get the vector in X. Uh, let, I will get this vector X plus Y. But you can see if X belongs to V, yes, Y belongs to V, and V in this case is R2, a plane, then their sum also belongs to V. Then we will get that their sum also belongs to R2. Yeah. And you can see the second axiom is also true. If you will take this vector x and multiply by c, which is bigger than one, let's say two x, you will stretch this vector. And this is the vector also will belongs to plane. And if you multiply by negative c, you will get vector in opposite direction. So you can see that cx also belong, belongs to R2. So this thing is a vector space. So this is an example. Another thing that you need to remember, understand, what is one of the examples when uh, something is not a vector space? So let's, because I believe the most important, like if you're given a definition of something, you want to show first that uh, something satisfies the definition, and then you want to show a counterexample that something doesn't satisfy this definition. Yeah. So let's take an uh, example, and again, like, I'm introducing kind of light introdu introduction of the Zilli algebra, but I want to make sure that everyone remember what, what is a vector space. So let me first uh, discuss the last example of something which is not vector space. Okay. Uh, and let's take instead of a plane, yes, let's take my vector space to be a points x, y, and such that uh, let's say y equals to 1. And I claim that this thing is not a vector space. Uh, why? So again, my V is represented by this line, Y equals one. So uh, what I'm going to show, I'm going to show a counterexample. I'm going to, sh to show that this is not satisfied, the first axiom that if X and Y belongs to V, uh, X plus Y doesn't belong to V. Let's take two points. Let's take point uh, one, one, and negative one and one. And I can see that this point is my point X, and this point is my point Y. So I have, this is my vector X, this is my vector Y. Clearly, because of Y component for both of them equals to one, then I have that X and Y belongs to V. But, you can check that x plus y doesn't belong to you. Why doesn't belong? It doesn't belong because if you will take x and y and add them up, what I will get? I will get that uh, 1, 1 plus negative 1, 1, I will get 0, 2. And after I will grab my 0, 2, I will get point over here. And you can see for 0, 2, your y equals to 2. So my x plus y doesn't belong to v anymore. And this is one example of the vector space, uh, of this example of the space which is not a vector space. Yeah. And finally, let's come back uh, to definition of Lie algebra. So for Lie algebra, what are we given? Are we given V, which is a vector space. And for vector space, we have uh, vector addition. 
And also we have scalar multiplication, but I would really like to give analogy that vectors are like numbers because a number is just uh, one component, but in vector, you just take this one component and trace it in positive x direction and you will get n components. And by using scalars, you can describe scalar fields and by using vectors, you can describe vector fields. And that's one of the reasons why I like to teach multivariable calculus because in multivariable calculus, uh, you can introduce really advanced math topics by using uh, simple examples in uh, like two-dimensional space. And this is one of the example. I believe I made video one year ago about this, about scalar and vector fields. So, and for numbers, we can add numbers, yes, but also we can multiply numbers. But for vector space over here, we can add vectors because vectors is just more general version of numbers and the more general version of numbers are tensors and tensors are super cool. Uh, maybe I can make a video or live session about tensors and uh, if people will be interested. So Lie algebra is basically what it's going to be. I want to define a vector multiplication and Lie algebra like definition is a vector space with a multiplication. So, um, uh, let's read this and let's give a kind of definition. So Lie algebra, uh, let's say this way, L is a Lie algebra if uh, L uh, has a vect V as a vector space and a bracket. And this bracket will uh, give us our desired multiplication because we have a bracket that you will take a V cross V and send it to V. So this is how multiplication works. You take two numbers, you multiply them and send it to V. to be. But for this bracket, in other words, bracket is just multiplication. But we use bracket because we require some specific uh, axiom for this bracket. We want for our multiplication that the first axiom, if you will take element and multiply this element with itself or find the bracket x, x, then for every element in my vector space, it is going to be equal to zero. And second one, that some weird Jacobi identity is satisfied. And Jacobi identity is just, if you will take any three elements, x, y, z, and first you will find the bracket of y, z, and bracket of x. Okay, so this is my favorite part when you just need to write definition and then explain it uh, by giving an example. And you will take y bracket uh, z, x, and you will take the bracket uh, z, x, y, then the whole thing, the sum of this three bracket for any elements uh, is going to be equals to zero. So it's for any x, y, z belongs to v. So basically, a Lie algebra is uh, a vector space with a bracket, or not, or bracket you can think about as multiplication when these two axioms are satisfied. Uh, and okay, so right now, like a couple of people are confused and like, uh, I feel like the best way to explain some definition is just give a concrete example. So let me give you a concrete example of a Lie algebra. And you're gonna be all like super surprised. And so uh, if there is any physicist, physicist over there, I'm gonna take R3, but actually I need to take R4, not R4. R3 is like Newton's time physics. Um, and for R3, it's gonna be my vector space V. So my V equals to R3. Okay, so for the algebra, I have my vector space. Yes. And let's define a bracket. So what I will have a bracket. So a bracket 
for element x and y in my space, yeah? What I'm gonna do, I'm going to take the cross product of two vectors, x cross y. And this is gonna be true, and this is, this is going to be a Lie algebra. Why? Because am I given a vector space? Yes, my vector space is R3. I'm gonna draw some cool pictures in a second so you will see. Uh, am I given a bracket? Yes, I have a bracket. So what do I need to do? I need to satisfy, I need to check these two conditions. So for this bracket right now, let's take, check the first condition. So I want to check that x, x is equals to zero, but x, x is just x cross product with x. And we remember the cross product with uh, vector with itself equals to zero. And this is true for any x and v, when v is three-dimensional space. And what about the second axiom? The second axiom, I want to check this Jacobian identity. Um, uh, there is, okay, so, but there is one formal that I can use. I can, uh, so let's try, we want to check if I will take any two vectors, I will add them up, uh, the Jacobi, uh, like their brackets, it will sum up to zero. So let's try first to figure out how I can represent my second bracket, x uh, bracket y z bracket. So what is it equals to? So it equals to x y cross product z. Yes, and then it equals to x cross product y and z. But this formula, let's just think about this formula for a second. Uh, let's draw some picture. I have x vector, uh, I have y vector, z, and let's say my x vector is perpendicular to y and z. So uh, what I will get if I will find y cross z? When I will find y, uh, y cross z, by definition as a cross product, I will get some vector which is going to be perpendicular uh, to yz plane. And so let's say I will get vector, no, it's, it's about a picture, x shouldn't be perpendicular, x should be look something like this. Because when x is perpendicular, I will get this red vector, then they uh, cross product equals to zero. So I will get uh, this vector which is y cross z. But right now my next step, when I will find y cross z uh, cross x, this vector is going to come back into y z plane because <laughs> this vector is going to be perpendicular to x and to y z, but the vectors which is perpendicular exactly lies in y z plane. Okay. My laptop is running a better, one second. I think it's a good idea to buy a Pokebot sticker. Okay. So uh, this vector is exactly going to be x cross y cross z. But if you, if you have studied linear algebra, then this y plane y and z are going to be exactly the basis uh, of this plane. So it means that this vector I can write in terms of y in terms of z. So what I will get, I will get uh, some constant uh, y plus uh, some constant b, z. So the consecutive pro cross product of x cross y cross z is going to be just a constant plus y plus b and z. And the trick is um, to find these constants. Uh, on a spot, uh, I don't remember exactly how to derive it, but the idea is that for uh, y constant, you will have x dot z, and for the b constant, uh, we will have uh, x dot y. 
And I believe uh, this is going to be this minus. Yeah. And this is a formula for the x cross y cross z. So it's going to be x dot z y minus x dot y z. Uh, so here, what we did, we just found one term uh, for this bracket. So let's see what I will get. So let's keep in mind. Okay, this was my uh, polar coordinates. So let's erase this and let's finally show uh, that the last identity holds. Okay, so what I will get for the first one. So for the first bracket, I know I will have uh, x dot z times y. So uh, minus, then my z component is going to be x dot y z. So plus. Here, uh, we can see that my base is going to be z and x. So for z, I will have y dot x z uh, minus y dot z x. Okay. And the last one is uh, I will have my basis in terms of x and y. Remember, as we did over here, y and z, y and z. So here's x and y. So what I will get, I will get uh, plus z dot y x minus z dot x y. And let's check if it's equals to zero. I have y x z negative y x z. So these terms are cancel out. I have x z y. I have negative x z y. So this is going to uh, cancel out. And I have negative y z x and positive y z x. So the whole thing equals to zero. So what I will get, I will get the Jacobian identity for my um, vector space. So this was my Jacobian identity. This equals to zero for any x, y, z in uh, e. And this is example of a Lie algebra. So a Lie algebra, you can think, is just a regular vector space with a given product such that these two axioms hold. I'm a uh, black pen and I'm using my uh, laptop. Yeah. Um, so this is like, like this is really important. Uh, and I have one question for guys. So like, I was actually really surprised um, when I read about this. So it's probability question. So it's super interesting. Like, like wow. So imagine yourself that you given a box with like, let's say, hundred balls. So you have hundred balls. And what do we have? What do you know about these hundred balls? We know that 60 of them black and 40 of them are white. And then I want to do some experiments. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take one. So let's make a couple of balls black. I'm going to take randomly one ball and see. And if I will take like white one, for example, I'm going to replace white one with a black one and put it back. And then I'm going to do this, to do this like, uh, let's say 10,000 times. So, so I'm going to take ball and switch this ball into different color. Take ball and switch this ball into different color. So after like 10,000 10, tries, for 10,000 first try, I want to compute the probability 
that I will get, uh, let's say, the white ball. What do you think? What probability am I going to get on the thousand first time that if I will take some random ball, this ball is going to be white? Yeah, like how in this video, I went from Cartesian coordinates to polar to Lie algebra to probability. So, math is fun. And they need to go home soon. But what I don't need like to know, I'm not asking you for exact answer. I just like, what do you think? Like, uh, what, what number should, should I get? Like 20%, 30%? Like, So we, before we had 40 white balls, so by doing 10,000 times, like what is going to be percentage? And the crazy part that if you have like 40 white and 60 black balls and you will switch them, some people can think that they're going to even uh, each other. So you will have 50 and 50 approximately in that after 10,000 times. But actually the probability of getting the white ball is gonna be approximately or super close to 30%. So in the long run, the average, the uh, probability that you were given in the beginning, because if you will find the probability by taking the first ball, you have approximately 40% chance to getting the white ball. If you will to repeat this process 10,000 times, uh, then you will get almost exactly the same answer with what you started. And actually, this is one of the idea uh, how people, if you, for example, you like to do bets and you bet on like soccer game, which team is going to win. So if you see in the news that this team is going to win with this coefficient or this team is going to win with this coefficient. So what they people do, they, don't know they don't know like this how many balls but they have a lot of data and they can just run 10,000 times different scenarios like artificial intelligence some algorithm and for of these 10,000 tr uh, tries they can get that the first team won 60 percent and team b won 40 percent so the winning coefficient for team A is going to be bigger than for team B. And the point is to do this uh, a lot of times. And this method of getting probabilities from the data, because if you check in that uh, some teams are going to, like if two soccer teams are going to play each other, uh, probably you have uh, the previous games, how these teams played. You also have how these teams played with other teams. So by using all this data, we can, uh, accumulate this into the model where you're gonna create like kind of uh, probabilistic variable and you will uh, run like 10,000 different uh, experiments how this team will possibly perform and then based on this data you will get uh, like these numbers and uh, the graph of oh, this looks something like this so if it was like your 40 percent of your probability like is that if you started as a ball and let's say you start here. So by using not a lot of tries, your number of your white balls can decrease, uh, sorry, increase and decrease. But when you're gonna do more and more tries, they're gonna stay closer and closer to 40%. And this is called in probability uh, central limit theorem. And another way how I, I, I like to think about theorem, uh, the short name of this theorem, like average rules. But another thing, if you're going to work hard enough, then, then your goal is over here. Then by working hard enough, you always can obtain your goal. Yeah, so it's like another one, like, oh, this is article, like I strongly recommend, if you haven't read, please read 10,000 uh, hours articles. Really good. Okay, so I'm gonna be done and let's see.
Okay, so thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy the algebra probability and other stuff. And bye bye. Okay, black pen, red pen. I'm going to be in LA soon. I'm going to be in the fourth of July. So let's meet and do some video. Or just have fun. Okay, have a good night. Thank you. Bye.